these mini consoles, they are everywhere now, but for me, they are about the experience. You know, do these little machines recreate that nostalgic feeling of the 80s and 90s of plugging in your proper system and getting a proper control pad and playing the games you had at your disposal? Does it recreate that? If it does, then it's a win. If it doesn't, there isn't much point really. So for this, I thought I'd take a quick look at the console itself and then look at the experiences of the 80s and 90s. What people, what critics thought about these games back in the day and maybe see how they translate to today. Now these pads, this, do you ever get that nostalgic feeling where you're suddenly back in the past at a particular moment? For me, with these pads, it's in my mate's house when I first got hold of one and I was like, whoa, this is the future. Look, look at the graphics this thing is capable of. And it was all kind of surmised and the memory is embedded in the shape and feel of this pad. And it's not quite right. Here's some original Mega Drive pads and they are, they feel different. Like this one is really smooth plastic and it's shiny. It's like that episode of Star Trek The Next Generation when Riker is in the fake bridge of the Enterprise and everything seems right but it's not quite right. Would anyone else like to speak up? Or shall we end this charade? Also, the original pads have little white, grey indicator arrows on the D-pad. They've gone with red on this one. They've kept the kind of grey start button which is nice but Ah, so the console, we're looking at it. It is a Mega Drive. It's got even the um, slots to slot it onto the Mega CD on the bottom. It's got the panel where you plug it into the Mega CD. They've paid attention to detail, which is nice, especially after a lifetime of things like this. Sega, you've done well. Even the, the volume button has a resistance to it. It feels like the volume did on the original console take the plastic off. Even this um, this flap works, doesn't it? There's nothing there, but oh, you say you have done a good job. I've got to hand it to them in the feel and look department. The experience is almost here, so let's plug it in. Actually, no, I want to find out what's making this volume button resistance first. Let's take it apart. It's just like a bit of graduated plastic by the look of it, so the further you push it up, the more it presses on the plastic and resists. Eh, very simple, but very effective. Oh yes, Samsung 816 chip, look at this. What about these pads? I want to see how these pads differ from the originals. So, here's the inside of a pad. Incredibly simple board there. So we've got some conductive pads. If we compare that to an original controller, internals of the <laughs> original pad. Here's the difference, here's a new one, here's the old one. You can see this is much more refined. The old one has massive traces on, big blobs of solder. But of course it does, it's from the 1990s. I wonder actually if I can transplant this new board into an original case. So the new board seems to fit fine in the old controller case, so I might give myself a bit of a sneaky what I consider to be an upgrade. I, I much prefer the plastic on these old controllers. It just feels more sturdy. All this new plastic, it feels brittle and um, thin. So there we go. There is the new controller board in an original controller case, which for me is a bit of an upgrade, even though this controller's got some strange uh, marks going on. But you know, original controllers had stains and strange marks. You wouldn't have a pristine controller. This is all part of the nostalgia. And you know, it's not knocking Sega with these, these new mini controllers. They are really nice. This, this is where it's at. So, 
HDMI in the back. USB in the back, of course, this thing has no power brick controller in the USB socket. Power on. Lovely job. Now, as these are wired controllers, the length of the wire is very important. Thankfully, it's all right. You know, it will do for quite a small room. If you've got a big lounge with a big TV and the sofa's far away, you might have problems. Now, I'm sure by now you know how good this little mini is. I'm sure you've seen videos describing how good the menu is and how good the graphics are. Uh, graphics for me aren't really a big thing. You know, pixel sharp detail. I didn't grow up with that. I grew up with a Mega Drive plugged into an older TV with an RF connection. So the grubbier the picture, the more nostalgic, frankly. But there are some emulation issues with the sound. Mostly it's spot on, but there is a delay when playing games. Which is more of a problem because with technology of the past, sound was instantaneous. Now, with it being slightly out of sync, that bothers me more than anything else would. But, you know, at least I've fixed the controller, so... Let's see what the critics thought of these games upon their original release. Well, this is a lovely little menu system, isn't it? Not only can we see all the box art, but we can see the spines as well. We can also flip to other languages and get presented not only with their box art, but localised versions of the games too. We even get the correct sort order for release dates, although due to lack of an American English option, I can't out of the box see the North American versions, which is a shame. Rather than going through in strictly European release order, I'm going to go through these games in Western release order, that is, the order they first appeared in North America or Europe. Because that's really how we digested things over here. After Japan, our eyes were fixated on the American market, and although we occasionally got a release ahead of our American friends, they mostly pipped us to the post. Now, for critical opinion back in the day, my go-to magazine was Mean Machines or Mean Machines Sega, because they seem to get it right most of the time. So most of the reviews will come from that. But I'll add a few others in for diversity's sake. We begin with Altered Beast, released on the 14th of August 1989 in America, and the system's original pack-in title. Here's a game that's almost as synonymous with the Mega Drive as Sonic the Hedgehog, and it's for that reason why it's included in the Mini's lineup. It may get a lot of grief nowadays, but it was actually received pretty well at the time. The games machine gave it a highly respectable 87%, noting that other than the Elmer Fudd-esque speech sample, Altered Beast turns out very close indeed to its arcade origins, with the background graphics spot on. And they're not wrong. If you're a fan of the coin-op, it's likely you'll be a fan of this version. Released on exactly the same day as Altered Beast, launch day, Sega were keen to demonstrate the arcade abilities of their 16-bit Wonder Console. Did Space Harrier 2 succeed? Well, Mean Machines were partly convinced. Matt commented that Space Harrier was a sensation in the arcades because of its speed and sit-down cabinets. However, its playability never really matched its looks and sound, and I'm afraid that's true of this game as well. Graphics scored highest at 90 with an overall percentage of 77. A slick and polished game that looks amazing but is rather dull to play. So, released just a couple of months later, did Ghouls and Ghosts fare better? Well, that Mega Game stamp clearly indicates that it did. Julian wades in with What a stunner! Not only does Ghouls and Ghosts have some of the best graphics and sound you're likely to see and hear on a console game, it's also one of the hardest games you're likely to play. Back when hard games were a good thing. It seems slightly ironic then that it only gets an 89% last ability score, but playability is the highest scorer, with an overall percentage of 92, coupled with the words A perfect conversion whether you're a fan of the coin-up or not. 
Don't miss this. Now we're talking one of my favourite games of all time, Golden Axe, released just in time for Christmas 1989 in North America. I bet some of you had an excellent festive season. Mean Machines clearly concur with my sentiments as we have another Mega Game Award and three pages of glorious fantasy screenshots, which must have looked mind-blowing to those who were used to the dull, pixelated 8-bit graphics on some other consoles. Matt loves this game. It's got everything I want in an arcade conversion. The two-player option is the most fun, but watch out, it's easy to hurt the other guy. Wise words there from Matt, and an even wiser overall score of 91%. A flawless conversion that even improves on the arcade game. Superb! I, for one, totally agree with this. The arcade game is good, but the Mega Drive version is just better. We're not ready to break the arcade cycle yet, and so we move on to columns. With the success of Tetris on Nintendo's Game Boy, it was clear Sega needed a similar offering. First appearing in arcades, it was now time for the home port, and most publications of the time were quick to praise Sega's efforts. Robert Swan thought that one might argue that there are already too many Tetris-alike games on the market, and another game would simply get swamped under the ever-increasing multitude. But when it's as slickly executed as columns, it's something with which to stand out from the rest. With a playability percentage of 94 and overall score of 90, Robert obviously enjoyed this puzzling affair, verbalising it as a flipping good Tetris style game that's got the spark of originality to keep it from being just one of the crowd. Now, shoot 'em up fans already know this is a great game, but was the new Sega community ready for this kind of barbaric frenzy in the autumn of 1990? Well, Rich certainly was. I first played Thunder Force 3 on imports when I started at CVG, computer and video games that is, and thought it was a mega blast that simply demanded purchase. Yes, Rich. He goes on to say that Since then, Thunder Force has aged quite a bit and isn't quite as good as some of the shoot 'em ups that followed. Gynog and Hellfire spring to mind. Oh, come on, Rich. Like that's relevant. It's still a corker. Julian chimes in with Thunder Force 3 is still one of the most technically stunning Mega Drive blasters around. The final verdict was An addictive blast which features stunning visuals. Check it out and a score of 86%. Here's a game which actually hit Europe first, by several months compared to its North American release. I suspect that's because we blooming love the Master System over here, and Alex Kidd in Miracle World on the 8-bit system was a corker. It stands to reason that those jumping to the Mega Drive would want an even better experience, but we don't quite get it. Alex Kid for me is a game which works better on the 8-bit hardware. Video games and computer entertainment, however, seem to enjoy it. The graphics are vivid and fanciful. With Alex Kid in the Enchanted Castle, Alex Kid fans get a chance to adventure with their hero in a state-of-the-art video game. My vote recommended. All right, Clayton Walnum, I guess we can agree to disagree here. Now, with the Genesis now firmly arrived in North America, Sega wanted a showpiece for their hardware, and they decided Castle of Illusion would be perfect for the task, and for good reason too, with the Disney-like graphics showing the console in some of its best light. Before Sonic was on the scene, this is the game Sega chose to tout their latest hardware. Here's Mickey Mouse, and if you take a look, he really looks exactly like himself. We haven't gone and sacrificed any of the detail on the character at all. Is this new this year? This is brand new. It just started shipping within the last couple of weeks. This wasn't a marketing gimmick either, with magazines of the time agreeing with the outstanding graphics on offer, combined with excellent gameplay. Matt noted, The programmers obviously took a great deal of care with his game. The backgrounds are phenomenal with the best parallax scrolling yet seen on the Mega Drive. Castle of Illusion would score 95% in this issue of Mean Machines, with other magazines offering similar scores. For those receiving Sega's 16-bit console in Christmas 1990, if they were very lucky, Strider might be also tucked away in a stocking. Mean Machines had got a review in from Japan months prior, awarding it Mega Game status well ahead of schedule. 
If you look closely, there's even a grey import warning to make sure people are aware that imported carts won't work on official UK Mega Drives without a Japanese game adapter. What does our trusty Julian say this time? When this was loaded into the Mega Drive, you could hear the sounds of Jaws dropping for miles around. It's an absolutely amazing, truly arcade perfect conversion. Even Matt agrees this time round. The main sprite is huge and well detailed, and the backgrounds are simply exquisite. The overall score of 92% then seems pretty fitting. So here we are, Sonic finally landed in June 1991, and Sega was never the same again. This wasn't just a changing world for Sega either, the world of video games was changing at a frantic rate, with fresh magazines popping up and newfound hype for the upcoming Super Nintendo console, poised to kick off the true 16-bit competition wars. Nothing prepares you for the amazing new Super Nintendo Entertainment System. Once again, Mean Machines were early with their review, grabbing the Japanese release just a snitch earlier than worldwide. At this point, I'm not sure if they realised the enormity of the Sonic proposition, or just what a sweeping change the blue critter would bring, but Paul was quick to sing its praises. Yep, it's true. Sonic is really great. I can't think of a Mega Drive game with more spectacular graphics. Even Mickey Mouse wasn't as visually exciting as this, and everything is just so fast and smooth, it's just astonishing. Of course, it's clear that the game had been anticipated, with Rich exaggerating, After about 15 zillion millennia of waiting, Sonic's finally here, and it's almost as fabby as Sega would have us believe. Almost Rich. Almost. Sound scored lowest with the comment, Vaguely appealing tunes coupled with excellent effects. Vaguely appealing? Come on, guys. Graphics came in at a pleasing 96%, with an overall score of 92%, and the singular remark, The best platform game on the Mega Drive! Go for it! Now, here is a game which seems to divide opinion. Some consider it a boring walking simulator, whilst others love the multiplayer possibilities of what was then a pretty original concept. Rad calls it a hilarious adventure from the cartoon style opening sequence to the in-game banter between the two characters. The emphasis is definitely on comedy. Whilst Julian exclaims, What a bonkers game! Toja and Earl is packed with the weird and wonderful things, from the whacked out belly dancers to the jetpack Santas. Good percentages all round are only let down by a last ability factor of 79%, meaning it falls just shy of that golden 90% mark. Another series which works beautifully on the Master System, and thankfully, it also works pretty well on 16-bit hardware. We've got a good amount of screenshots, but I love the big visual centerpiece of this review, showing off the glorious graphics. Originally, Mean Machines attempted the Japanese version, but the difficulties with translation meant they had to wait for the Western release before truly getting stuck in. Rad notes that The sprites and backgrounds are highly colourful and detailed, although the animation leaves something to be desired, with laughably wimp sound also. It's strange how now we barely hear the word background mentioned. But then, the background of a game was an important factor, and really demonstrated the difference that 16-bit consoles could bring. Julian wasn't as impressed by the graphics, but comments that Monster Land is both absorbing and addictive, all thanks to its marvellous playability. Overall, gaining it a commendable 88%, keeping Wonder Boy fans happy for weeks. Now, upon its original release, this game completely passed me by. In fact, I think it passed a lot of people by, and that's a shame because it's a decent platformer. All hell has broken loose in Fantasyland, where once again the forces of darkness have risen up from the depths of Hades to give the living a bit of a bad time. That beginning, combined with how stunning the graphics look in screenshots, seems hugely compelling to me, and I'm surprised it didn't make more of an impact. Julian notes, This is what Toakun should have been. Alicia Dragoon is an excellent platform-based blaster and sports challenging gameplay and some pretty unusual features. Rich notes, 
At the beginning, I thought the homing lightning beam would make this too easy, but as soon as I reached the end of level boss, my preconceptions were horribly dashed. Alicia Dragoon is a tough mother of a game, throwing everything but the kitchen sink at you. And to be fair, he's not wrong. Mean Machines gave their highest mark of 92% to the graphics, calling it a visual feast with an overall rating of 87, adding A good fusion of platforming and shoot 'em up elements make for an absorbing, challenging game. Reviews in other publications were all pretty similar. Now here's a game I always found a little strange. I mean, its premise is great. You as Kid Chameleon enter a virtual reality game called Wildside and immediately end up taking on game roles in real life. This magazine spread depicts some of the protagonists you will become, alongside many clips of platforming delight. Personally, the Splatterhouse persona does it for me. What did Ray say about it? Kid Chameleon is certainly a novel twist on the platform concept. The addition of kids' multiple personalities certainly adds to the originality and make things a bit more interesting. Yes, this was a time when originality was highly praised, and while sticking to the platforming formula, Kid Chameleon managed it in bucket loads. Playability was the top scorer with 89%, and although the overall rating of 78 isn't quite up with the best, the main flaws were noted as being too easy and lack of variation between levels. Other magazines of the time took a similar view. Seriously, if Sega did a Master System Mini, I would hecking love it, especially if Fantasy Zone was on there. Still, the Mega Drive incarnation is almost as good. This time we're popping over to Sega Pro Magazine for the lowdown. No one can say the graphics in Super Fantasy Zone are bland. On the contrary, they reach out from the screen and literally tear your eyeballs from their sockets. Well, not quite literally, lads, but we get the idea. Damien Butt seemed to think that this was a reasonable outing, although was unhappy with the annoying gap between collisions and actual explosions. Still, it was enough for him to award a pro score of 80 giving graphics the highest rating at 90. I reckon he prefers Fantasy Zone on the Master System as well. Ah, now what can the critics say that you don't already know about this? I remember when Psych 2 was penned for release back in 1992, with the launch day being dubbed as Sonic Tuesday. Those clever little marketing guys. After all the hype, Sonic 2 is being released worldwide next Tuesday, or Sonic Tuesday. This is a copy of the first ever rough sketch of Sonic given to me by Mr. Kanari, his creator, when I was in Japan recently. But seriously, the hype was huge. With TV now catching up with the international phenomenon of gaming, we were now surrounded by our first love. It was even in newspapers of the time, and Sonic was one character who started to feel more mainstream than perhaps gaming had beforehand. Of course, Mean Machines was there to cover the event, with four pages dedicated each to the Master System and Mega Drive releases. Chaos was the centre stone here, with the special stage receiving a lot of attention, mainly because through clever programming the graphics seemed incredibly advanced for the time. Of course, Tails was now here for the ride and it felt, well, exhilarating. Paul chimed in with Sonic 2 is a blinding stonker. None of the criticisms of the original apply here. Sonic 2 is faster, slicker, more colourful, louder, bigger and much, much tougher than the original. Praise all round meant a mighty score of 96%, with pretty much every other factor deservedly receiving over 90. From one synonymous title to another, 1992 seemed to be the year where the Mega Drive was really making waves, if you'll excuse the pun. Graphically, Echo the Dolphin looked as much delight on paper as it did in the flesh. And although it wasn't everyone's cup of tea, the emotional story helped galvanise interest in this singular game. Echo is a totally original concept in exploration games. The gameplay ever so slightly resembles an ancient game called Scuba Diver. And yes, it does. It actually reminded me of a budget Spectrum title called Scuba Kids, which I really loved in the 80s. As usual, the review is packed with information boxes, providing glimpses of the game, but with a whopping overall score of 97%, this seemed to be a title that was essential for purchase. It wouldn't be a Mega Drive Mini without it. 
arguably, nor would it be without Road Rash 2. You could always rely on the Mega Drive to conjure up games that Nintendo would completely shy away from. Roaring across undulating roads on a superbike whilst smashing the competition with a chain was definitely not Nintendo material. This was the good old days when Electronic Arts served up wondrous games that everyone clambered for. Donning his crash helmet, Rich commented, I'm happy to say that Road Rash 2 is better than the original, with faster gameplay, more taxing opposition, and more bikes. The two-player modes are excellent as well. Although Rad noted, This is more of a Road Rash with extra bits rather than a completely new game. Still, it was good enough to get 93% and the claim of Best Mega Drive Road Racer. And so we're back to Disney, this time with a verbally challenged duck. World of Illusion builds where Castle of Illusion left off, and I find it a much more compelling title. It seems most magazines of the time agree. Lucy says, It is, in fact, a damn good game. It's amazing how a bit of imagination, some neat animation, and a stack of variety can jazz up your run-of-the-mill platform romp. This romped nature meant the game received a score of 91, with graphics naturally being the high point. Can you imagine Sega issuing a mini console without a Streets of Rage game? There would be pandemonium on the streets. People would probably end up dead. Now, admittedly, I would have preferred all three titles to be on here, but I'm sated with just the second, although personally, I prefer the first. However, most people seem to prefer the second game, and I guess that's why it's on here. Including whoever this is. She's got neither feet or a name, apparently. My initial reaction was, hmm, a snazzed up version of the original, but with a few added extras. How wrong I was. This one eats the prequel for breakfast, spits it out, and then comes back for more. Sound and playability came out top here with an overall score of 90, with the comment, The best scrolling beat em up ever to hit a home computer. Nice. I haven't been so glued to a game since the time when I first bought my Mega Drive almost four years ago. Well, Paul, that bodes well for Shining Force. Here we have another RPG which oozes style and playability. The Mega Drive might have been famed and even designed for arcade conversions, but games like Shining Force proved it was equally as suited for more sedate yet graphically rich affairs. Gus notes, This is fab stuff. The sort of game to make you stay up way past bedtime. Personally, I did that with quite a few Mega Drive games, but maybe here's one I should sink some more time into. Shining Force isn't a title I would have chosen myself, but frankly, it's titles like this which offer new experiences and reasons for actually buying a mini console in the first place. Mean Machines awarded 91%, naturally earning Mega Game status. No introduction is required here, but in 1993 it was mandatory. There's this bloke called Green who has two friends named Blue and Red. Collectively, this trio are known as the Gunstar Heroes, a mighty intergalactic fighting force that don't take no hassle. Astounding! Seriously, this game ought to come packed with sedatives for all of the exciting visuals it produces. The battle against Black's forces is tough and spectacular. A stunning title both in appearance and the gameplay it offers. 93% then, well deserved. Shinobi is a series I personally feel I should have got more involved with in the 90s. It always felt compelling, but never enough for me to commit to and purchase. So it's pleasing that I can now sit down and get stuck into arguably the best game in the series, although not everyone will agree with that. Revenge of Shinobi remains one of my favourite Mega Drive games ever, so I was extremely anxious to get my hands on the sequel. Now I have, I'm in two minds about it. I can see it's a brilliant game that's a lot bigger than Revenge of Shinobi with better graphics. I was disappointed by the music. Still, sound scored 87% and the overall rating came out at 88, which is pretty commendable. OK, let's jump across to the excellent publication, Computer and Video Games, for Street Fighter 2 Special Champion Edition. Look at Garth, he is loving it. 
the biggest game for a decade has landed on the Mega Drive, and it's the finest you'll see on the system. And he wasn't wrong. Street Fighter 2 Turbo had arrived on the Super Nintendo about a year earlier, so this was a very much hyped release, appearing on all our favourite TV game shows. I've been looking forward to this one for quite a while, and I'm hoping it's been worth the wait. Paul says, Arcade Perfect Presentation shines through this 24 megabit monster. C and VG would naturally award a high rating of 94%, although they didn't need to, it was already going to sell quicker than wildfire engulfing a dry forest. If anything, I'm now shocked at the number of RPG style games on this system. I'm not complaining as they offer excellent value for money, but it does feel that maybe this isn't the general cross section of titles the average owner would have had in the 90s. But like I've already said, that's a positive thing. I mean, look at all these visuals showcasing this isometric delight. Mmm, isometric. Pool. Landstalker doesn't make for any groundbreaking achievements, but is something very different for the Mega Drive. At times, I find the odd perspective employed is confusing. Platforms that appear in one position may lie in another. I will agree, I feel the same about this game, but it's something you can quickly get used to. 94% was awarded on this occasion. When Sonic Spinball arrived, it was the talk of my playground, at least. Here was a Sonic game, but yet it was very different from the usual platforming speed fest. However, it didn't feel unnatural. In fact, throwing Sonic into a pinball table is probably one of the most natural things in the world. Did the gaming press agree? Well, yes and no. Most magazines agreed that it wasn't quite the Sonic we know and love, but yet it provided enough entertainment to keep us engaged for a good few weeks. Just when you thought there was a new contender for Game of the Year, it's all over. Sonic Spinball offers pinball fans a dizzy love affair. Fun while it lasts. And that's the issue. Four levels simply wasn't enough to validate the £49.99 asking price. With inflation, that puts it well above the price of the entire Mega Drive Mini. It's like we don't even know how good we've got it. I feel the overall score of 81% is completely fair on this occasion. I mean, that's still technically an 8 out of 10. This may be a region exclusive, but it's actually a reskin of the Japanese game Puyo Puyo, which of course is included on the Japanese Mega Drive Mini. Puyo Puyo is a game which Mean Machine Sega reviewed, and it appears they liked it. It's also a game that received a fair amount of hype even before its Dr. Robotnik moniker. The excitement preceding Puyo Puyo's arrival here affected my opinion somewhat, but even so, it lives up to the hype. This is an extremely fun game, tough too. In fact, it's hard to retain a respectable facial expression as the brain enters new realms of mental torture. That, Paul, is a statement I can completely agree with, especially as I'm slightly colorblind. 90% overall, not too shabby. Mean Machines felt it fitting to award six pages to review Eternal Champions, another much-hyped fighting affair, maybe not up with Street Fighter 2, but pretty darn close. Rather than a straightforward overview, we're treated to an in-depth synopsis of each character, along with their strengths and weaknesses. Rad noted, Just about every beat-em-up in the last couple of years has been touted as a Street Fighter beater, and Eternal Champions is no exception. The difference is, though, that this is one of the games that comes near as damn it. Whilst I don't completely agree with Rad, there's certainly worse games out there. The massive 97% score concurs with this. So how about an American magazine, Game Pro to be exact, for our verdict of Castlevania Bloodlines? Another Nintendo-aligned style of game, and in fact, series. It's weird to even see a Castlevania game on the Mega Drive. On their opening paragraph, Slasher Quan notes that Mournfully, veteran vampire hunters will find that Castlevania suffered a heavy loss of gameplay as well as visual and audio appeal. It appears this is one title that perhaps didn't benefit from blast processing. Still, the overall verdict was reasonable enough. This is more of a Mega Drive style, Earthworm Jim, another game which captured the imagination of Genesis and Mega Drive owners all over the world. You only had to peek at the fluid and colourful graphics on offer to know this was something rather special. 
Packed inside the 24 meg cartridge was a whole lot of game. Paul was even brave enough to cough the words, Roll over, Sonic. A new kid has come to town and he means business. That's how huge this little worm was in the 90s. It scored a commendable 93%, which is damned good. Although, to be fair, not as high as Sonic 2 scored. By this point, I'm starting to realise just how many games Sega have packed in to this little device, and I'm slightly regretting elaborating so much on each game. This was supposed to be a quick video offering some nostalgic insights, but now we're knee deep in Dynamite Heady, and Sega are no doubt laughing their cotton socks off. Here we have yet another mega game. Sega clearly weren't going to put Dross in this box. It's a game which I never played in the day, but I was very aware of it. Paul. First we had the superb Earthworm Jim, and now we have Hetty. With two excellent games in such close proximity to each other, it seems as if manufacturers have finally got the message that people will no longer put up with duff platformers. And those comments ring true. 1994 felt like a kind of second coming for the Mega Drive, a renewed golden age, and these shiny and graphically impressive platformers were at the heart of proceedings. 93%. Get heady as soon as it comes out. No ifs, no buts. Known as Rockman Mega World in Japan, the keenness of Mean Machines to get a review meant that's the title we first witnessed. It falls into the same league as 40 Towers videos, old episodes of Upstairs Downstairs and Morecambe and Wise Christmas specials. The various adventures of Rockman inspire the same nostalgia amongst game players as certain TV shows do for a wide constituency of couch potatoes. Consisting of Mega Man, Mega Man 2, and Mega Man 3, this trio of titles scored a not unhealthy 78%. It's not a game I enjoy, but I know some of you do, so it's here. Contra. It's a title we know and love today, but back in 1994, all we received was Probotector, mainly due to the German market that required the human violence to be dumbed down in favour of robotic annihilation. Still, it's just as much fun. In fact, I think I prefer it with all these crazy, gnarly robots knocking about. I especially love how their faces morph from one to another in the selection screen. Steve. I'm a massive fan of Konami's Super NES Contra game, but always found it a little too easy. With this Mega Drive version though, Konami's developers have listened to such criticisms and have created a game which is every bit as playable as the original, but infinitely more rewarding. A masterpiece of Mega Drive programming. It was awarded 94%, which I believe it more than warrants. It's a delight to play today as much as it was then. Oh, and if you want to play Contra Hardcore instead, you can just change the language to Japanese and you get their version, which is nice. Sega haven't released a proper RPG since... Or the end of World War II, says Steve. You wouldn't know it if you owned a Mega Drive Mini, would you? Fantasy Star 4 is a shining light. You trail around the towns and villages, solving puzzles, buying supplies, and talking to the locals. When you get into areas of danger, things take a different turn. 88 overall score, the best pure RPG for the Mega Drive, but deemed fit only for the land of the free. Yep, that's right. Whilst this game came out in the USA during February 1995, Europe didn't actually get this game until the opposite end of the year. Mean Machine's Sega Issue 29 covered the story of Thor, dedicating a whopping six pages to its dazzling cartoon graphics and engrossing gameplay. It's yet another RPG kind of arcade adventure, but to many fans of the gloriously drawn Nintendo RPG games, this was the Mega Drive's answer, and it let few down. What I like about Mean Machine's Sega at this point was the little information boxes they had. Here's one. Game Aim. Reunite the twin armlets to protect your kingdom from the evil intentions of Shade and the Silver Armlet. What did Gus have to say? I cannot recall a Mega Drive game of quite so much quality and detail in a long time. Enormous work has gone into the character animation, not only for Thor himself, but all his adversaries. Paul's thoughts were on a similar vein, but also noted that Being able to save the game at any point may sound like an ace idea. 
but it does detract from playability. Pretty sure Paul wouldn't appreciate most games of today then. The overall score is at 93%, with graphics receiving a huge 96%. Let's call this one an arcade adventure rather than an RPG, shall we? After the disappointing alien soldier, Treasure hit peak form again with the Light Crusader. Although the game has been in development longer than most RPGs, it's easy to see where all the work has gone. It looks stunning. It's interesting to read comments like that and compare them to the blurb that Sega gives you as an introduction to each game. Little comments like, the veterans at Treasure poured their hearts into this action RPG are really a nice touch to the interface here and clearly tally well with what people were saying at the time. What did all this hard work score? Well, a respectable 80%, although it did fare better in some other publications. Another title that received a hell of a lot of hype. It seemed like this was the age of making games resemble cartoons, and the closer they resembled them, the higher the wow factor. So actually building a game around a comic strip was pure genius, especially given it plays well to boot. Gus. In some ways, Comic Zone is completely original. In others, much of the same old malarkey we've seen in beat em ups since the Ice Age. But it's impossible not to like this most quirky of recent Mega Drive titles. The game just missed out on Mega Game status, with a very commendable score of 89%, playability scoring the most at 91. For me, this game goes alongside Earthworm Jim and Dynamite Heady as one of the New Age platformers, and clearly Marcus agreed. This is pretty smart in just about every sense. Visually, it has detail and fluidity unusual to Mega Drive games, while the gameplay is satisfyingly fast and explosive. Vector Man himself is one of the most impressive aspects of the whole caboodle. It does feel like a game that you need to see in real life to get the full experience, but obviously Mean Machines had seen it and awarded it a deserving 90%. What was this? The Mega Drive trying to keep up with the Sega Saturn? Released near the end of the Mega Drive's real life, this is a strange one to include on the collection. I mean, it looks a bit like Virtua Fighter 2, but it lacks all of the three-dimensional features that make Virtua Fighter, Virtua Fighter. Of course, that's simply not possible on the 16-bit hardware, so it just seems really odd. I guess the fact that it's undeniably a Sega game just about warrants its inclusion. In the January 1997 issue of Mead Machine Sega, Matt noted, There's no denying that the Mega Drive is still a great games console. But as a 16-bit conversion of Virtua Fighter shows, Sega's outdated hardware has finally reached its limits. Gus disagreed somewhat and said, I do think it successfully captures the identity and character of the VF world. But it's clear that Gus missed the point. Still, it scored 77%, which I personally think is more than it deserved, even then. Today, it's more of an obscurity, something you might peek at in a museum and wonder why it existed. Maybe that's why it's here. So, Tetris, Monster World 4 and Darius are games which never witnessed an original Western release. In fact, Darius is a brand new conversion, so there are no reviews for these games back in the day. For me personally, I dislike playing Tetris on anything other than a Game Boy, I find Darius compelling but hard, and Monster World 4 is a welcome addition which I've yet to really sink my teeth into. As for the console itself, well I think it's a robust entry into the mini-series of consoles. I grew up with Sega consoles, and although they don't always hold as compelling a story, or as polished a feel as some of the Nintendo games, I bloody love the Mega Drive and the arcade ferocity it brought to our lives. If I have to be critical, I did notice some glitches in games which I've never seen in real hardware. I mean, what are these guys doing just hanging about at the sides of the screen, and what's Sonic doing just stopping here? I, I don't know. But you know, that may just be because I was looking hard for errors, expecting things that we'd witnessed with the at game consoles of the past, but thankfully, being pleasantly surprised by M2's work. Although given M2's ports of games on the 3DS, there should be no surprise there at all. 
This is a quality affair, and the only thing that really bothers me is that sound lag. It is noticeable, it's displeasing, but I will remark that when you're engrossed in a game, you don't actually notice it half as much, so maybe there's hope yet. As for the games, well, based on critical opinion, they seem good. About half of them I personally would have chosen, although that means the other half would be something else entirely. Of course, it's subjective, so outside of personal taste I think they've done an excellent job, especially considering licensing hurdles. The choice here is compelling, yet diverse enough to retain your interest for a good number of months. I mean, if I had all these games back in the day, it would have kept me entertained for years. And given the Mini's price tag is not far off the cost of a single game in 1993, it's really very easy to justify the cost, if you want to, of course. Anyway, I'm fairly happy with this little critter. The only thing I need now is a mocked up Mega CD and 32X, and I'll be in Bliss Central. Good God, dreams really do come true. I'm sure you're aware by now that inside the actual Mega CD component is a nice little Easter egg. Sega aren't stupid, they knew people would take this apart to mod it, and therefore gaining a nice bit of extra coverage, but it also shows the attention to detail taken here. Sadly, there's no piece of cardboard in the 32X, I guess they wanted to build us up and then recreate that disappointment from 1994. Nice job, Sega. Of course, all these accessories are for aesthetic purposes, they don't function. But once again, it shows how close Sega are to their fanbase. I mean, recreating a mini Tower of Power and throwing in all this technical artwork is truly excellent. What? You can... you can buy cartridges as well from Japan... You can get cartridges from vending machines! Time to go to Japan. Oh, and if you want to play Street Fighter 2, then get one of these eight button pads. It works a charm. Even though I prefer the three button pads. Thanks for watching. Have a great evening. 16 bit arcade graphics. The 30th anniversary Genesis Dust. 16 bit action. The 30th anniversary Genesis Dust. Does. Genesis Does. Does. Does.